On this episode, I sit down with Nate Clark, who is the skydiving realtor hailing from Austin, Texas. Today, he'll share his proven strategies for working the phones to collect seller leads. We will also unpack his philosophy around standardized scripts, what holds people back, and most importantly, we will talk about how he can double down and literally do double the work in half of the time. Before we get started, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you can be connected to top performing realtors across the nation with each episode that drops. And without further ado, I'm your host, Sean Conkler. What's happening, Nate? Hanging out. Another Friday. It's Friday. You made it. (laughs) I did. And this week was a we made it week. So I was pretty sick for the first half of the week. I got back on my uh, phones, back in my business the last, the last day or two. And that's some appointments set up this morning. So I got a couple tomorrow and into next week and uh, definitely ready to get uh, rocking and rolling. That's awesome. Well, before we dive too far into this, the thing I always like to do with guests is just really quick, high level. Who are you and what do you do? Absolutely. So I'm Nate Clark, the skydiving real estate agent, which People think is a big marketing thing, and it obviously is. But uh, I made about four thousand skydives as a professional skydiver and skydiving instructor, um, which is what brought me to Austin, Texas, which is where I'm at now, selling real estate. Um, but I moved to Texas in 2015 from Boston, Massachusetts, where I grew up. So it was the skydiving that it got me down here, and I purchased my first house in 2016. And I uh, I clicked a Zillow lead link and she showed me two houses and made like eight thousand dollars off it. So of course I go, oh, this is all you know. You you show up for two hours and you make a commission check out of it. This sounds like uh, sounds like the job for me. So um, for the first year or two that I I got my license, I was still working part time as a skydiving instructor um, at the time. So I'd be like doing skydives on the weekend and then in the thirty minutes between jumps, running into the side room to check my phone and and see what was going on. And I basically uh, sort of bootstrapped my business model from um, just door knocking off the bat. So I just started door knocking for listings. Then as I closed a couple of deals out of that, rolled my commission checks into a dialer. Uh, and in 2018, just kind of decided to take pretty, pretty massive level action, uh, making these cold calls, which I'm excited to talk about. Nice. I didn't realize you were from uh, the East Coast. I'm from Connecticut originally. Yeah, you- yeah. Actually, I I saw the post about your uh, your Mustang, and I, I went to school in Hartford. So, oh, did you? Connecticut, yeah, Trinity. What happened? You lost all your your East Coast accent. You have- yeah, thankfully, it's it'd be real hard <laughs> slang in real estate down here. You bet. You bet. Believe I got rid of that five hundred eight number for a five one two as well when I started having clients down here. That's funny. Well, it's cool. You got the accent, but it sounds like you kept your sarcasm. So we'll we'll be able to riff perfectly. Perfect. So what was your catalyst to to move? Was it just the skydiving? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So I had um, basically done that from uh, 2010. So pretty much right out of high school when I turned 18, you, you know, do a tandem jump for your 18th birthday. And that set the set the hooks in me pretty good. It definitely can be a little addicted to the adrenaline. Um, so I had done that just sort of during the summer in between college and stuff like that. And then I had a job in finance for for about six months um, when I was you know just out of school in, in 2014. And I, I got to go from jumping out of planes and hanging out, drinking beer with my buddies during the summertime between college to like this very corporate, you know, 65, 70 hour a week job. And it was kind of like you can just see 40 years down the pipeline without any interesting deviation or really anything to to get the blood pumping. So uh, I had a buddy that had moved down to Texas. He was working as a skydiving instructor and he was like, man, come down here. There's cheap living, good weather, pretty girls. And I packed basically my whole life into a Volkswagen Jetta and moved down here on, I think, two and a half weeks notice in July, 2015. It was scary. I was terrified. I was. That's. I do all the skydives, but moving across the country like that was uh, a lot scarier than I to jump out of planes. Amen. I think it's so. I agree. It's completely. It's very hard. And I had a similar, not similar, not so similar. I worked in a factory. My father had a manufacturing company, and a, I saw a similar trajectory for myself. And I was like, it's not that there's anything wrong with it. It just wasn't my DNA. I'm too entrepreneurial and. I always want to push myself and challenge myself, learn new things. And I just, I didn't see a life for me in that world. So I, 
Upton moved. And when I moved cross country, I drove a forerunner cross country when gas was actually cheap. But <laughs> holy hell, it back is a scary day. way back in it was 20 years ago. It was a scary endeavor. It's very uh, your whole life is in upheaval. I remember at one point I had one key, which was my car key, which was weird. And I was like, that's literally the only key I own. That's it. And like all my stuff is. Don't is, lose this. Yeah. Don't, don't screw this up. If you're not growing, you're dying. So that it can be pushing past that um, to get out of the situation that you're in, which may not be terrible. But if, if you and I are the same, like I feel we are, it's you want to have stuff that excites you and, you know, gets the blood pumping every day and motivates you to wake up. And I can work so much easily, um, longer hours and feel more inspired and motivated in this than in any other role that I've had. Similar. I, I'm very addicted to the adrenaline and I, I didn't skydive until my thirties. It was actually my 30th birthday, but I was into motorcycles heavily, dirt biking and then martial arts. And if it went fast, I was totally into it. And and if I wasn't like, my rule is if I'm not a little bit terrified, I'm just, it's not going to keep my attention. And so it's like, what can I go and, and find in sales in the real world gave me that thing, that, that hook. And it sounds like with you as well, it's the, it's, you have limitless potential in this business. Like wherever it stops, it's because you decided that that's it. Like you can always push a little bit further. hundred percent. I have a, I don't have it in this office since I've moved offices from my old house, but I had a, you know, a poster that said some of the things that I love about cold calling. And, and one of them is, is every day I have the ability to determine my income as much as you want or as little as you want that whether it's cold calling or whatever lead gen or um, just whatever form of building your business uh, that opportunity is on you to keep pushing it forward that's incredibly powerful and i hope people didn't glaze over that because what you said was just really profound in that moment is you had a postcard that says what i love about cold calling and i find that the language that we label things with is how we then view it and then how we go after it or we don't A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And cold calling is one of those things where it's very black, very white. It's it's very polar opposites. And people are like, I either love it or I hate it. But the people who hate it have a very different list of I hate cold calling because, whereas you have a very different list. And my thing was always open houses. And I remember talking to people in the office and they're like, oh my God, I hate it. It's so much pressure. I, I feel awkward. I feel this and that. And of course they performed really poorly. And so my, my challenge for people is look at your words, like your words create meanings and they create energy and, and the words that we're crafting and using around these things, like what we're labeling, so important. And for me, it took, um, I think it took a little bit of trying to lean into a culture of people that were doing the activities that I wanted to do, because I was the person that, you know, I'm a Keller Williams agent. When I came to bold, they said, you're going to call all these people. You're going to call all these people. And I, I told you, I just clicked a button on Zillow and found my agent and she made eight grand in like two hours. So I said, I'm going to call all these people. That's, that's not now I'm now I can call. I mean, you, I call people till I'm blue in the face for six hours a day. As long as I got split screen monitor, I can watch something on the side while I'm making my, uh, making my dials. But, uh, but at the time it, that, that just sounded like the craziest thing in the world. And what really got me to wrap my head around having a different, uh, mentality of positivity about it was being, there was a, a very long, uh, thread. I think it was a Canadian agents forum. And there was this thread. I make a hundred cold calls every day. I love it. And this thread went on for thousands of pages. And it was this guy at the start was talking about how he was basically just trying to make contact with a hundred or 150 people every day, everybody telling him how, you know, how crazy it was. And, he would just continue to post his results of how many dials he was making, how many leads he was adding to his database, and then the appointments he was getting from those. And this thread had carried on for seven or eight or nine years and had, you know, all these people jumping in that this guy who they said was crazy at first. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm using these dialers. I'm set, you know, this is how I'm doing it. This is the contact rate I'm getting. And that was something for me where I, I would have had an aversion to making those dials initially. And it was something where uh, it took you know, seeking out a community of people, um, like you've, like we were talking about the benefits of of masterminds, um, finding people that are doing the actions that you're, are having the results that you want to achieve and see what the actions that they're taking. And then hearing them speak about those, like you could hear me speak about my positivity towards cold calling, wasn't something that was 
been just ingrained in me naturally. It, it, it took some cultivation and it wasn't even necessarily intentional cultivation. I just, I think like most of us can go dive deep in a forum. And when you're seeing the same thing over and over and you're just hearing it reiterated to you about, I mean, these people making these sales, these commission checks they're making, you know, how it's bringing them and their families and their businesses up. There's nothing that can be more, um, I think, motivating and uplifting than that. So, so I would urge people to seek out those communities and seek out places where they're they're hearing the success of others, especially if it's in an area where you have, uh, you know, limiting beliefs, because that was something where um, I got into that thread and I said, I want a cold call. And I was with a team leader at the time who was not not very pro cold calling. And as soon as I told him about that, it was, oh, this is, you know, this is the worst thing. This is not going to work. I could never call people all day. I could never do this. And then I started doing it and getting, you know, listings from it. But I also very quickly realized that that wasn't, uh, you know, a team leader or mentor that was somebody that was going to help me fuel my business the way that I wanted to work for me. I could, I could hate doing something, but if somebody that's, you know, working for me and going to bring business towards me, I'm going to say, you know, do it, do it to the highest level you can. Yeah. I love that. I There's so many really great little pieces in there of hang around with people you aspire to be like, and it's just virtue of that. They will pull you just be, by being around them. It's infectious. They will pull you up to their level. And that's actually the whole spirit of this podcast is that is I get to hang out with these really amazing agents across the the nation, and I, I get to glean these pieces of of their excellence. What are they doing in their category? That's how we met. Is we met on a an online, it was a group on Facebook, and and I think I can't remember. I posed the question of like, what was the one thing you did last year, and we're crushing it. And your numbers, I was like, oh my god, this dude is killing it. And then we just started talking, and I was like, listen, I have to have you on the show. So let's actually start with the end, then we'll kind of unpack it more. Yeah. You got some big numbers you're putting up. Let's let's just take the right now immediate numbers. How many listings do you have? I think I have it's about seven million in listings. I think it's um probably nine or ten listings that I have. So obviously here in Austin we're uh we've slowed down a little bit. What goes up must too come down. Sure. One of the things that I think is awesome for me, I love it when the market takes a bit of a shift. One, because I'm always looking at investing, but two, if you're actively prospecting for expired listings, there's no better time to be a, you know, an expired listing specialist or a good telephone prospector than when you have a lot of inventory, when buyers are sitting on their hands, especially during the winter months. I think on January 1st, we had 600 expireds come off of the MLS. So I'm sitting just dialing them for, for two or three hours a day to try and get, you know, list those and set up those appointments. Most of them are, you know, we're listing all the way through the year or, or into next year. Um, and a lot of times it's educating people about the price they need to be at and some of the concessions we're making now in the shifting market. But yeah, so I have about 7 million in active listings right now. Um, I just got a, I think I got one this morning off of a woman that wasn't even an appointment. She just goes, you think you can sell it for 300,000? And I think it looks, looks good to go. So that was one where there wasn't even an appointment out of it. Um, but I've got, I've got four signs so far for the year. Uh, basically right now I'm running a, a first quarter of the year. So kind of first, first 12 weeks, I'm, I'm shooting to take 10 listings. I initially had it as a nine listing and 90 day challenge. But I was tracking ahead of that, so I, I bumped it up to an even ten. And I don't necessarily think that I'll be able to track that across uh, forty listings taken for the year because of just how much more you can relist right now, a virtue of it coming off expired. Um, but that's that's definitely something that I've been hitting hard is prospecting for the fresh expired listings uh, coming off of our MLS here in Austin. Yeah, and to your point, as market shifts continuously we're never in a stagnant like this is going to be the market forever it's it's seasonal there's seasons to it and so we have to lean in to when those opportunities come up it's an, like we're investors you buy low sell high and when the opportunities come up you just you got to double down and speaking of double doubling down to get these listings share your strategy that even i was like whoa <laughs> Yeah. So we were talking about that before we hopped on. And I said, um, you know, I'm not an expert in a lot of things, but one thing that I am an expert in is telephone prospecting for, for these listings and just telephone prospecting in general. And one of the things that always seems to make people's heads kind of explode is that when I'm making cold calls, I have 
uh, two dialers going at once. So I have one phone with my AirPod in, and then I have my other phone um, with my Blue Parrot headset set up. And I've got two computers as I'm calling. So I'm calling on two triple line dialers at once. Uh, most people are using a triple line dialer or, you know, some services, they're just using a, a double line dialer or a single line dialer. And what we realize is, especially with the uh, reduced contact rates that we're seeing um, with Sturge Shaken and some of the other telecoms protocols that are in play right now, the contact rate is is significantly lower. You're really not going to be hitting 10% or 15% contact rate. If you're hitting that, you can dial on three lines and you'll have you won't have a lot of dead time in between live answers. But for most of us, if you're getting a four to maybe seven or eight percent contact rate, you actually spend a lot of time just just sitting there, you know, watching your um, watching your records scroll through without actually having any live answers. So this does two things. One, it takes twice as long, or maybe not twice as long, but almost twice as long to dial the same number of records as it would if you have two triple line dialers going at once. But two, which is more important, I actually find that my energy and engagement is significantly, significantly higher when I'm having more con you know, more contacts per hour and less time in between those live answers. You can keep your energy up, feel like you're making contacts as opposed to spending an hour to have three or four conversations, which can be pretty painful when two of them are hanging up right off the bat and one of them is a bad number. I find a, a really, really good practice to have. For my end, it's $150 for the additional dollar that I have. So $1,800 for the whole year to spend half the amount of time. I'm spending two hours as opposed to four hours a day on lead gen. And for me, it feels like I'm a lot more effective with that time. My energy levels are way higher. I just really have a, a deep work session kind of from 8 to 10, 10.30, 9 to 11 a.m., somewhere in the morning, have a really deep dialing session. And that's far and away the most productive and the most focused and um, kind of the most like flow state I feel like I'm in during the entire day. Uh, but having the having the two triple line dialers is something that people look at you like you're crazy, but it's actually very infrequently that you have what most people are concerned about, which is two pickups happening at the same time. And then it's really easy. You just, whoever picked up earlier, you know, if I'm already talking to Sean and Bill starts answering, I just, I just close that, you know, close that contact out and pause that dialer while I'm finishing my conversation with Sean. Yeah. I mean, I, don't overthink it. Just drop one call, take, take, take the first one and just start. Just do it. I had another guest on previously and they were like, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be consistent. Oh my gosh, man. I am far from perfect. I, I, I put my foot in my mouth so many times. You wouldn't believe it. Even this morning, just getting on the dials after three or four days of not being in it. I'm still kind of tired and need the suit of fed to kick in a little bit more or something. I'm like, some guy, you call the DNC list? I'm, you know, normally I'd have a million funny quips for him or something like that. And I'm just like, oh, so the, this, the skills are, you know, even if you're making 600 dials a day, you take a couple of days off and it, yeah, you can put your foot in your mouth a million times. But the beauty of it is, who are these people? They don't know you from Adam. Yeah. It's easier for me calling, making cold calls and calling lukewarm leads or calling, you know, friends that are asking about selling their property because you can just be, um, you know, be competency and performance and education based and treat these people like, like you're consulting with them like a, a, a doctor would, as opposed to um, if it's, you know, a close friend or something like that, you're, you're, they're strangers. So you can make those calls and you can definitely put your foot in your mouth. But if you talk to enough people, you'll have, you'll have crazy stuff happen. I had some guy I've never met before. I've sold his property. I sold two properties for him. I've never met him since. And he goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. You sound like, you know, what's up. Um, what's your address. I'm going to put my garage door opener in the mail. I'm going to mail it to you. Go down to my house, open it up, look inside, let me know what the price is and sell it for me. Like that. $15,000 commission check. The guy had moved to New Orleans from Central Texas. So he had a New Orleans Saints uh, like man cave with a bar and TV and stuff like that. And I took, he, he let me have all his beer. I got 15000 I didn't have to pitch a listing appointment. I drank all this guy's beer. And I got this huge like cowboy hat on. And that's somebody. That's the type of stuff that happens if you talk to enough people. You'll have these crazy corner cases where it's not to say that happens often. But I had a guy I called on a, a four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars duplex that came off, and I listed a 
$2.4 million new construction for him on 13 acres. And we're putting up a million dollar new construction right next to it that he's building out. So that's amazing. You know, they say contacts equals contracts. Maybe they just think about contacting people and just like, I want to, I don't say I want to be your friend, but just talk to him like a friend as opposed to forcing your script down your throat. This crazy stuff will, will come out of the woodwork, which is really, really cool. And when you see from point A, all the way to point D or all the way to when you've made that commission check on their past client of yours, when you can wrap your head around it, that's something that makes it a lot easier to continue with that process. So I feel very, very fortunate. I feel like it was some stroke of luck, maybe the universe saying you need to keep making these cold calls. But actually the first day I was ever making, um, making any cold calls on my dialer, it was, it wasn't calling expireds. I just started with circle prospecting, just geographic neighborhood, just terrible short script buyers looking in your neighborhood. You think you're going to sell your house the next year. And in 45 minutes, I had spoke with some woman whose uh, I think mother had died and they had to move back to Alabama or Arkansas or something like that. But within 45 minutes of the first time that I was ever making those calls, and this isn't pat myself on the back. This is just like a stroke of luck. But somehow I got an appointment, not calling expires, you know, calling just completely circle prospecting, which normally from a first contact, there's like a six to 12 month nurture process before I actually list those as opposed to expires. I'll, I'll book them right away and, you know, sign them up right away. Um, but this happened in, you know, 45 minutes of the first time dialing. I said, oh my God, I just am sitting here in air conditioning, calling people, asking if they're thinking of selling their house. And I just booked an appointment and I listed the house and sold it. Obviously with expireds, it's more typical to be able to do that. But since that, since that happened, it took like a year and a half before I had another time that I was circle prospecting as opposed to calling expireds. And I set an appointment on the first go around. So for me, it's easy to say, I know, I know cold calling and I know making these calls will work. And for a lot of people, it feels like you're just like, this is a crazy concept that you could call somebody and that they'll want to give you their business. Um, but as soon as you see it happen once, it gives you so much confidence to be able to speak to these people without it feeling so scripted. And as soon as you see your own value, as especially as an expired listing specialist, if you have a better plan of attack, if you take better pictures, if you're a dominant listing agent who can consult your clients and, and set reasonable expectations and educate them on you know proper pricing tactics and the market dynamics, you, you have such a high value offering versus most of these people that for the last two or even six or seven years have just stuck a sign in the yard and most everything sells itself. So as soon as you take that process from point A to point B, C, D, and as soon as you've built a couple of deals out of it, it becomes so much easier to prospect for that business. And I think that's something that people need to realize is that the first one is going to be way, way, way harder than the ones that you do after that. It's sales, sales 101. You have to, you have to build up that pipeline and yeah, I mean, sometimes you do get the beginner luck. You just happen to call the right person at the right time. And I was very lucky. I was putting my foot in my mouth a lot at that point in time. So that's building experience. Like experience comes from making mistakes and then learning from them. And the only way to get that experience is to go through all of that. And it's that's the numbers game is, you know, who there was a, a baseball player that said he said something like the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah. I can't, I, don't, I can't name it, but I know the quote. That's what it sounds like you're living by. It's like you just you just keep putting it in day in and day out, and then it shows up. In the last six months for me, I feel like has particularly snowballed as I've implemented a bit more back end um, in conjunction with uh, a lot of the calls that I'm doing, but they're always the the leader. And for people, um, for people that are looking to be listing agents, and for people that want now business and for people that are in markets where there are properties coming off the market. And if you're sitting on a couple months inventory and you're getting expired listings every week, that should be, I think, for most people, a number one source to go to, especially if you're an agent that doesn't have a ton of resources, you're not running a ton of ads, you don't have time to wait for stuff to kick in. Um, make these calls and you'll be able to turn around and turn them directly into listings. It's funny. I had a conversation with another agent today who somebody they were talking to was recommending they do uh, mailers, farming mailers. And he's like, I have, and I did them for a year. And the person said, well, you didn't do them long enough. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's such a, it's a great idea, but the it's, it's, that's too long. It's just money. It's just money. It just grows on trees. Right. 
you're just throwing it into a hole <laughs> and it's vanishing. That's what the the team that I was on was was mailers, mailers, mailers. And I said, you know, let me just print these flyers out and go door knock and go put a face to people. And the first listing I got was a guy who had a sign that said, we're too broke to buy anything. We all, we already know who we're voting for. We found Jesus. So like, go, unless you, unless you're leaving beer, go away or something. And I, I left my flyer with him and I said, Hey, if you want to have a beer sometime, you know, give me a holler. And he calls me two days later. I'm out at the skydiving drops and in between jumps. And he's like, Hey, you left this flyer. And I was like, Oh yeah, I'll bring you a beer. He's like, no, I need to sell my house. And that was a tactic that I took from the mailer end of things to you can take mailers and you can do it for free by being in the neighborhood and getting out and talking to people. I recommend doing it um, in the in the evening. So you get up basically, up. it's all about efficiency. So whether you're making calls or whether you're door knocking, it's about the efficiency of whatever time you're putting out there. So don't go out there at 11 a.m. when everybody is at work expecting to you know do your daily activities you've got a little bit of extra time take those flyers go hit the neighborhood that you're trying to farm try and count the contacts that you're making try and talk to 30 people if you do that five days in a row you will get business out of it 100 percent. but most people don't want to they just want to mail it which is going to cost you you know more money anyways um and you get a much better result out of people putting a, a you know having a face-to-face or a voice-to-voice connection the sweat equity of actually showing up in front of somebody is, I don't think people realize how incredibly huge that actually is. Yeah. It's easy to ex- actually explain is when you get something in the mail, observe yourself as you go through your mail and look how quick you look at these flyers and you're like, toss, toss, toss. Oh, a bill, toss, toss. What's this? Oh, nope, toss. And you will just blaze through it. Yeah. Whereas if somebody were to actually knock on my door, it, that's a very different experience. And and then what they say and how they come across and if their personality shows up, that's going to then move them into the category of like, oh, this person is likable or they're not actually just trying to sell me. They're trying to, to solve a problem or help me or or whatever it is. Or at least they start out bringing you a bit of positive energy as opposed to being like, what can you do for me? And as soon as you get that off of that initial connection or all the time these expires that I'm calling have other people calling them and are pissed. And within, yeah, yeah, oh, I'd be pissed too. A million people are calling you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep this super quick. Are, are you having a good day at least, Sean? And then that's the type of stuff that that energy and you know meeting people like a human Um, And carrying that energy just does wonders for the whole, I mean, so many people, I think, shoot their sales script in the foot by uh, thinking about their goal as opposed to just trying to treat people like people and bring good energy. Similar to what you were sharing a moment ago, there's patterns, right? There's patterns when you're hanging around with successful people. There's patterns that just show up. And in this podcast, I have absolutely noticed patterns and showing up. It leading with relationship is a huge pattern. Showing up consistently has been a huge pattern. And if we just kind of go to these basics and do these simple things, it's night and day. And it's and I think the other fail point that people have is you should have an idea. And, and you can, I would love your opinion on this, but this is mine. And I hope it's a little controversial, but I hate scripts. Hot take. I think scripts suck. But I think the concept of scripts are fantastic. Like, I think you should have an idea of where you want to go, but I don't think you should try to force the person to go there. For example, if you showed up and you saw this sign on the door and you just like went into script mode, that dude might not have called you. But when you observe what you see, you make an empathetic statement to it and you're like, hey, if you ever want to grab a beer, let me know. Yeah. You scratch the record for them and they're like, wait, this is different. And now you're approachable, but you didn't adhere to this script, but you have an idea of where you're going to go. It's, it's kind of like driving your car to the market. There's probably more than one way to go. There's more than probably three ways. And there's probably different ways. You can walk, you can ride your bike, you can take a motorcycle, you can drive a car, you can have somebody else drive you. There's 20 different routes you can take to get there. You might go one way when the weather's nice and another way when the weather's bad or when it's scenic or not. But you know where you want to go and you know when you get to the market what you want to get. And I think that's the important part. But 
organically checking the weather, hang, if you're hanging out with a friend, take these things into account, use your sensory acuity and then adjust. And I, and I personally think with sales, retail sales, like anybody on a floor, open houses, calling, the big fail is trying to take every single person on that same route. A hundred percent. I'd I say a hundred points to Griffin North that comment because I echo that in entirety that um, you want to know where you're going and you want to know maybe how to pivot off of uh, certain points of the conversation that are going in the wrong direction. You want to keep stuff back on track, but the whole regimented scripted, that's what, especially if you're calling expired listings, you know, they're getting, they're getting a million people. So I'll show you. And, and obviously you can't see it super well in here. My, my script is mostly just a series of a couple of, you know, a couple of questions that I have in here that I can rotate through. And the main thing that I have at the top, I always have a reminder in all my scripts. It says, remember, you are a powerful listing agent because the most important thing is the energy that you have when you get on those calls um, and the way you're interfacing with these people and understanding that you can kind of throw everything out the window and just break the ice with them a little bit. Yeah, It's too easy when you're starting out making the calls to get you know, into a really, really regimented kind of script mind frame and you sound super, super robotic. And one of the best things that I think you can do to fix that is just make lots and lots and lots of calls, talk to lots of people, because like I said, I've, you know, picked tons of listings from this and all morning I was kind of putting my foot in my mouth till the first, you know, the first conversation I had where I connected with somebody just like human and was just talking and laughing. And a lot of times it's somebody who's not even going to sell. Maybe their plans have changed. Maybe they realize, okay, interest rates were at 7%. I'm going to regroup and kick stuff down the can next year. I'm still saying, of course, that totally makes sense. Let me just, let me just uh, get your email. I'll send you over my information. You can be in touch. And you, you know, joke around. And I say, oh yeah, are the interest rates, you know, tripling every two weeks? Is that cramping your style like everybody else? And, you know, people are laughing. And as soon as you get that connection of like, two humans talking like we're talking right now as opposed to somebody with a script coming at somebody to try and get their business. I kind of feel like I, I blossom and I open up and the rest of my conversations really benefit a lot uh, from that first interaction that you have. And it's about having that personal connection. And it's not about having a lead that's qualified or setting an appointment or something like that. Usually the one of the, the conversation that gets me started into having the best conversations that I have that day is somebody who, who didn't sell, isn't going to sell, but at least we joke around for a couple of minutes and just feeling that you can get that energy and, you know, maybe make them smile and make their day better um, and just wish them the best. It allows you to go on and just kind of steamroll the rest of the conversations that you have for that day. There's a distinction, and I think most people miss this too, between objections and conditions. And objections we can spin them into a, a solvable problem. That's our jobs as, as salespeople. But conditions, don't try to solve it. Try to understand it. And then once you understand it, then you know when to circle back with them and actually follow up. And then it, like, it's very clear. And to, to kind of unpack it, if people don't, aren't familiar with it, again, an objection is something you can turn into a question and then you can answer it, solve it. A condition is... They need an extra $50,000 for a down payment. They don't have it. They have to save for it. It's going to take them six months. That's a condition. Unless you want to give them 50000 bucks, you cannot solve that problem. So you have to now wait six months. And But I, understanding that and not pressuring them, and then, again, just identify them as a human, it goes such a long way. Yeah. To go back really quick, because people might be listening to this on the podcast and not have the video component of your script. You had a handful, it was only one quick short sheet and there was a handful of questions. How many questions did you actually have? And they were just short sentences. I mean, the main questions I really have is, uh, you know, I'm asking them if it's still available or if it got sold and they forgot to mark it off. So that's something where uh, some people aren't even aware that their property had expired. Some, you know, asking, is it available instead of saying, did your, did your house expire or some of these other scripts that I've seen? So once, once I've established that the house is still available or it didn't sell, you know, I ask if they were getting offers or what happened. I, I go, wow, it's a you know, beautiful place you guys got. Um, I'd like to get a bit of information on, you know, what they were planning on doing or, or, you know, what their plan is. So 
with how much stuff has shifted in the last six months, I think it's totally reasonable for a lot of people to want to pump the brakes and wait and see what happens. So I'm not, you know, pushing on people to, um, to be listing or to be accelerating their plans or anything like that. But I'm trying to figure out, you know, what their goals were, what it felt like uh, was happening, if they were disappointed about the process or if it's something that they're planning on returning to try and do as our market's coming back alive. Um, a lot of times in this market where um, some agents haven't been aware about some of the concessions like a 2-1 buy down and some of the other stuff that we have been providing here for the sellers that, that are actually selling, educating them about that. <clears throat> But I'm basically asking, you know, if, if, if the house is available or if it got sold, if it got any offers, um, if they were low balls or if, if something changed with their condition that prevented them from moving. So I had a really interesting one where I actually interviewed this past week and I interviewed against, I think, four or five other agents for this expired listing. And the woman, I called her the day afterwards and she was like, it's awesome. You know, you won it, you got the listing. And then I was called her two days later to get you know, get the paperwork signed and start getting stuff rocking and rolling. And uh, she was supposed to have knee surgery and she realized she actually, it has to be an amputation. So she's going to be, so that's when you talk about a condition, you know, somebody who thought they were going to have a quick surgery and be out of the house a month later to list their house is having something a little bit more serious. So you want a, a good, you know, representation of condition versus objection. I'm, you know, I'm not getting her, her lower leg back. That's just something that she's going to have to have her, medical thing done and, and time has to pass for that to happen. So I'm figuring out if there's anything, you know, that's happened with their situation that's going to keep them from wanting to try, uh, try to sell again as stuff kind of comes back alive. And, and then usually I'm just, I mean, you know, talking a little bit about what happened with their previous representation or if they're aware of some of the stuff that's going on. You know, I, I am very clear to speak with expired, um, expired sellers that, over 60% of the business that I do is sellers in exactly their position. And I don't say I do 65% expireds. I say over 60% of the business that I do is people in exactly your position to emphasize that to them. And that's something I say at my listing appointments and as I'm pre-qualifying them in the call. Uh, and, and then I pitch them for the appointment. And uh, I think I do pretty well building the rapport because there's really not much kickback for me just saying, why don't we get together for 15 or 20 minutes? I can show you what sellers in exactly your position, again, emphasizing that kind of uniqueness of being an expired listing. I can show you exactly what sellers in your position are doing, some tactics they're taking advantage of in the shifting market to make sure that you can sell, sell for the highest price and make the best use of the equity appreciation that you've seen in the last two years as stuff is kind of cooling off a little bit. And if they haven't, they usually haven't had an agent that was explaining to them what's happening with pricing, what's happening with inventory levels and stuff like that it's pretty easy to explain that to people and I just try and get in front of them. Uh, and then I have a pretty good pre-listing kind of marketing packet that I get with them and I just treat them, treat them like people. I think it's a bit of, maybe a bit of Ricky Carruth in my approach, but just meet with them, sit at the kitchen table and I'm definitely more genteel and slow. And I take longer listing appointments than when I used to really just try and power through stuff. And I would, um, urge people that have more of like a Mike Ferry approach to consider slowing down and focusing on that relational aspect and element. And that's something that for me, uh, my listing appointments are taking longer, but I'm taking almost all of them. That's great. I think the one little thing that I learned in the listing presentation, and I actually learned this from open houses, it changed my listing presentation tenfold, very similar, slow it down, basically meet them at their own pace. And I literally bring a really nice notebook, like a moleskin, leather bound. And I sit there with a really nice pen and I just write tons of notes. And I do that because similar to going to the doctor, if a doctor was looking at their phone and glancing up at you from time to time, even if they were just taking notes on their phone, you'd be like, Homeboy is pretty rude over there. What is he doing over there? Yeah, he's swiping on Tinder or something. If they're sitting there with a notebook and they're nodding and acknowledging you and they're writing notes and you can see what they're writing, they're, the, the listener, the, the seller, they're way more engaged with you and they will be more likely to just divulge more information because they know you're locked into them. And the only thing that exists for you is them. I find just... For bonding and making a relationship with somebody who you literally just met, 
by far the easiest way. And if you're at an open house meeting people, I have a little notebook in my suit pocket. I pull it out. I always have a really nice pen with me. And then I take notes and I look them in the eye and I nod and I, I write it down. I say, tell me more about that. It changes the game, changes the relationship right out of the gate. I'm going to have to go to Amazon, get a, a Jeff Bezos hook me up with a little moleskin, moleskin action for my listing presentations. I like that. It's a very subtle and it's not, it sounds like you're already doing clearly of a, a similar things at a and performing at a very high level, which is impressive. It's all about the little tweaks we can add in. And um, that's something that I think when, when, you know, the first time somebody presented to me that if you go to a doctor, he's not going to cut his commission or, you know, treat himself like he's brand new at something just because 90% of agents don't see their value proposition because a lot of agents don't necessarily have a greater than average value proposition. Um, but when you do see that and when you do feel like you are going to go farther and spend more time and um, spend more money and energy on the marketing of what you're trying to sell, and if you're fully invested in it, it makes a big difference. This is a true story. So a few, probably a couple of years ago, I jacked my back up super hard. I was working out, tweaked something, and it was a couple of days and it was incredibly uncomfortable. And so I'm like trying to find a local chiropractor, same way people search for agents. I did a few searches, looked up reviews, found one, called. They were like booked out for a month, called another one. They were booked out for six months. And then I called another one and it was that chiropractor who answered. And it was late. It was like probably like two or three in the afternoon. And I was like, listen, like, when can I get in? And they're like, well, we close at six, but I can stay late. And did you want to come in tonight? And there was this level of desperation. <laughs> and I took the appointment and then I hung up and I was like, anybody who's not that busy and will go over, drop everything it didn't actually feel good. I get what they were doing and I understood that they wanted to help, but from a, on a different level, it didn't feel right. And I actually wanted the one who was like, I'm booked out for six months. I'm like, dude, if you're booked out for six months, like you have a serious client base. You're like, I just want the guy that's booked out for six months. that will slide me in next Tuesday and I'll have to deal with the wishy-washy stuff. Exactly. And that's if, if, if you're positioning yourself then as a realtor, that's the realtor you, you ultimately want to be is be the one who's like, you know what? I just had a cancellation. It's uh, tomorrow at 12, 12 to 1230. You can take it, but otherwise I can't see you for three months. Changes the game. So, and that falls into your value proposition. And I'm not proposing that you lie, but I am proposing I'm, that's, that. That's, that's how I usually am and up being booked out. So I got my time blocked for, uh, for making my calls. And having your time blocked, which you said earlier, you have a very specific time in the morning that you do your, your prospecting. And then of course you're going to have times when you meet with clients. I only meet with clients on certain days. I meet with them at certain time blocks. And then if I don't have availability in that time, we push it out. And so I personally, and, and everybody's different and you have to figure out what works for your business. Um, that's just, this is the path that I, I figured out works best for me. I've never been at, at all performing on the level you are with, with calls. Um, when you kind of trend, when we trend out of this current market and things start to evolve and ex, the expired listings tend to go away a little bit more, how do you pivot? One of the big things, uh, like I said, is, uh, circle prospecting tremendously. So even when there aren't expired listings, before I had uh, even gotten the expired data and was calling the expired, you know, for a couple months before I had paid for that stuff, I was just circle prospecting. So just by talking to enough people, you 100% can get listings and can get um, not necessarily now, now business, but if you're making enough calls, you can almost always find stuff in a three, six, nine, 12 month period that you will be able to list. It's about having consistent follow up. Um, it's about making sure you've qualified those leads so you're not wasting time. I've got a ton of leads with past tasks that I'm going through and, and tossing out right now um, just because I'm realizing as I have good leads to pursue, the old ones you need to cycle through and get them out. For myself, I've also um, started building an email database. So as I'm calling, I'm 
getting emails. I've got past client emails and stuff like that. So I have about 16,000 people in my email database and I'm doing a weekly um, email to that. I'm also pulling that through um, some of my data providers and stuff like that. I've got a, a weekly email database that, you know, sending those emails out to. And that's about 16,000 deep with about a 30% open rate. So now I'm getting a lot of business off of that, having people contact me off of that, um, having just all kinds of random stuff come off of that. But in general, I've, I've also found that by circle prospecting and by just talking to tons of homeowners, you're going to always have people that are thinking about moving but a year or two away. And those are the types of people that you just double back and loop back with. Uh, and basically having made these contacts for a long amount of time, I just have a lot of people within my database that um, may not even be selling a house, but are, you know, in my people farm where I could call them and see if they know anybody that's selling. So it's all about just making as many connections with homeowners in your local market as possible and then utilizing them in, in any way possible. But it's definitely nice to have as many expires as there are um, right now to, I mean, I would encourage everybody before stuff starts drying up to be double down on that with your standard circle prospecting what's what's your pitch what do you how do you open the door with the, how do you start the conversation with that subset of people yeah so i used to just call anybody and everybody and tell them we have buyers looking in their neighborhood to see if they were thinking of selling their house in the next year or two years i'd have people so i have perfect example to contact chuck i contacted him in i think october of 2018 i sold his house last spring I sold his house and there's a, a cold call with a four year nurture time. I sold his house. I sold his next door neighbor's house. One of the other neighbors down the street walked past and saw the two signs with other contracts on them. I guess she had talked to some other agent, but they hadn't signed the paperwork and the other agent got very angry, but I sold that third house out of it too. And then another neighbor across the street, I sold their house and double ended it. So that's five ends out of one phone call from over four years ago. And that's not to say that that's not to say that you'll be able to get a lot of now business for it. But if you're calling expireds when they're expires, calling for sale by owners when the sale by owners aren't all selling on their own in the second day, if you're circle prospecting when you don't have the other two to call, definitely expireds are the highest priority. And if you don't have them, you got to do something else. Um, but calling, doing those circle prospect dials, you know, getting people's information, getting people's email addresses, emailing them weekly for life, following up with them. If, you know, Chuck said, I'm moving to, you know, moving somewhere on the East Coast, I knew he had a place he was thinking about moving at least. So that to me gives me uh, a reason to at least follow up with somebody every couple of months. And it, it turned into being, you know, five ends in, I don't know, five weeks or something like that. And now I've got, two more listings in the neighborhood coming up, coming up in the next month or so because of all that stuff that I sold. So it all kind of, um, you know, builds onto itself. Uh, but when I would start the conversation with, with that one, I was just, we've got buyers looking in your neighborhood. So I would like to circle prospect around, for instance, listings that I have, other ones that I've put under contract, other properties that have sold and just let people know, you know, hey, we sold your neighbor's house over on Vista Gardens Drive. They got, you know, seven offers. You get has any thoughts of selling in the next year? You know, is this is this your forever home? You guys ever think of getting out of the subdivisions or I don't know, moving back to Houston where you came from? Just having those conversations. But the thing that I would always do when I was doing the circle prospecting is I would contact at least a hundred people a day, and then I bump that up and I said a hundred isn't enough. I'm going to contact 150 people every day, and it's a lot harder, honestly, to contact 150 people a day now than it was in 2018, just with the pickup rates. Um, but I would challenge anybody that if you talk to 100 or 150 people a day and you can't find these people that want to sell their house or these random corner cases of people sending you their garage door opener in the mail, that's just the type of stuff that happens with percentages over a you know large enough sample pool. So let's say with these people, do you glean their email? Do you... I'm assuming you segment your list and then within that, do you give them all the same message? to do more like the automated? So I write all my emails. It's a weekly email, but because um, I cover basically, I'm, I'm in Austin, but I we have three MLSs, Austin, San Antonio, and the Central Texas MLS. I have kind of property down and used to live where the Central Texas MLS is at. So I actually cover a very wide geographic area that I um, you know, prospect for listings and sell listings over, whereas buyers, I'm more you know, within, within Austin itself. 
but so it's basically a central Texas market report, and it'll have information off of all three MLSs, kind of what's been going on, what the inventory levels are, median sales price, um, median sale to list price ratios. I'll have information at the bottom about the listings that I'm putting up, you know, pretty pictures of nice luxury listings, telling people what's going under contract, making yourself look good when you get multiple offers and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, I think that uh, what what I've experienced for myself personally is that somebody that's a good writer, um, somebody that, that, you know, writes and speaks well, I don't think there's anything that impacts me as, as much as a well-written um, value add informational email that isn't just written. Like I enjoy running the numbers every week. I enjoy looking at what the market's doing. I enjoy kind of analyzing all of this stuff uh, a lot more than, you know, the econ degree I took in college was <laughs> terrible. Um, so, so I, I really enjoy it. And I love, you know, every Wednesday I send out my weekly email at 325 PM. I do have my list segmented, but most of what I'm doing is just basically uh, every Wednesday I'm doing an email that's the same to everybody. And then I'm obviously giving updates on Fed meetings, on CPI reports, on stuff like that. But people all the time are contacting me and, and saying, thank you. You know, this is really, really valuable information, especially when you're pointing to some information that's contrary to a lot of the FUD headlines that we're seeing about everything is going to hell in a hand mask. When you tell people, look at, look at the data, right? Look at the data. Um, that can be really, really helpful. So they, my lists are segmented, but I haven't, uh, I haven't segmented the information that's going to them. I just have them, I have like 35 lists, even though I send them all the, uh, the same thing, but it's mainly just staying top of mind. Um, people are seeing that, you know, I'm selling properties in Austin. I'm selling properties way north of Austin in Temple. I'm down close to San Antonio. I'm all spread east to west across the county. Uh, so that's that's something that's good for, for people to see. But no, it's, it doesn't have to be super tight geographic um, data or anything like that. In general, people just kind of want to know what's going on in their area or their neighborhood. And... I found for me personally with, especially with newsletters is I try not to label things, meaning I will just give you the information. And then if you want to say this is good or this is bad, that's on you. And I find in doing that, I'm not challenging any of the, the media. It's here's the information. Here's what's actually, here's the properties that sold. Here's where the ones that were overbid. Here's, here's the ones that were over list price. Here's the ones that under, and now you, the consumer can, you choose. You you can you can label it as this is a good market or this is a bad, and then usually that starts the conversation. Then people will ask me my opinion, and that's different. And then I'm happy to share it. One thing that I've found is gets a really really good response is anywhere, especially in Central Texas. We know a ton of uh, you know manufacturing tech companies are coming here to headquarters. So any anything that people hear about development upwards and outwards in the area that they think is going to bring their home values up. So for instance, Samsung just announced they're basically putting $17 billion in to build a chip plant in Taylor, Texas, which is just about a half an hour uh, northeast of Austin. It's going to be a massive project. It's the largest ever foreign investment in Texas. And that's something that people love hearing about stuff like that. You know, Micron was going to put a $140 billion chip plant in here. And when you're letting people know about this stuff, you know, this is the stuff that we see in the business journals and, you know, some commercial Facebook pages and stuff like that. But informing people about the type of stuff that does have a material effect on their property value and the desirability of the areas that they're in is something that can really get good clicks. And people do see that as being valuable information. You must see a lot of referrals because I know you have a lot of tech that I have in my backyard. We have Tesla, Google's here which is also YouTube and a, a handful of others. Are you seeing still, I know we've seen a couple of years ago and then absolutely when the rates were lower, we saw a significant amount of people moving from California to Texas, which I, I know you guys didn't love, but it happened nonetheless. I'm the Yankee that ran down here to get away from the cold. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I just, I just do a bit better y'all are in than you Texans coming down here in your shiny Teslas. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but are you seeing a lot of, um, or do you receive a lot of referrals, agent to agent referrals? I do. Um, I've definitely been more focused on networking with other agents and stuff like that, particularly over the past two or three years. I definitely was, I think at the outset, kind of like on an island making my cold calls, just like I'm the you know, salesman who can't be sold. I don't want to go network and I don't want to go to all these events. I just want to make my calls and make my money and I don't need to go to the office. 
Um, but I, I really do enjoy, honestly, what I enjoy is um, helping other agents that have been asking me about cold calling and stuff like that. So just in one of the masterminds that I've been where it's mostly investors, uh, there are some other realtors in there and, and um, we've been kind of keeping each other accountable. And I really enjoy um, other people having respect for taking massive action and, and helping people see that it's really not that hard. And I'm, you know, not the type of person that can sell ice to a Eskimo or something like that. But if you make the calls and you put in the work, you'll get, you'll get a great result out of it. So I've really enjoyed getting to network with more, um, more realtors talking about cold calling and lead gen. And it's really cool because, uh, you know, I can lend a lot of value to people in places like cold calling and getting some of the systems and data and kind of getting, you know, getting your hardware set up. And then there are people that can really help me with stuff like social media and understanding you know, where I want to be positioning myself. So I, I always feel like uh, the tide rises and so too does the harbor. And it's been really, really cool to to get to link up with some some badass agents. I 100% agree with you is, you know, if you step back and you know, we know this about relationships, relationships are not a place to go and take something they're a place to go and give something. And if we're networking, but we're, we're trying to lift up agents in other areas or just agents, realtors in general, we're providing something of value. It not only makes us more memorable, but we're more likable. And we then build that relationship and the client they have, you know, just like your story of Chuck and the multiple sales that came from that, is you don't know the relationship you and I are forming right now can five years from now, you can be like, Hey, Sean, I got somebody moving to San Francisco and boom, it creates this whole landslide of, of positive change after the fact. But if, for example, you just send me a, a direct message, Hey, I'm in Austin. Let me know if I can do anything for you. It's just not going to, it doesn't, there's no value. You just showed up to take something. And so I think that's a great strategy of, and that's how we initially got this ball rolling is like you, you're, you're out there sharing and I'm like, dude, that's amazing. Like how, like, tell me more about this. This is great. And then now we're actually sharing it on a, a very large network to, to colleagues across all 50 States and, and beyond. I want people out there making calls, getting those listings, making bread and breaking bread. There you go. Right, you should do a challenge. Come up with a challenge. It's the uh, 10 listing in 90 day challenge is what it is. I got to hop on board with me. Yeah. I think that one's a phenomenal one. I'm at four. I, I, I kind of ripped that off a buddy, but then I said, I think I'm going to track above nine. So I might as I'm, I'm pushing for harder goals versus easier goals. And there just happens to be a lot of expires to farm for. So if y'all are on it, come try and get those 10 listings in Q1 of 2023. Set yourself up for success the rest of the year, depending on what market you're in. They might be selling already. Um, if you're like us, I think you're going to hit a certain point where a lot of buyers come back to market and we're going to be cashing some great commission checks. Exactly. All right. So if somebody wants to reach out to you and actually commit to doing this, this challenge with you, what is the absolute best way for them to find you? The best way to find me would be on Instagram at skydiving real estate agent. Very creative. And maybe you don't get 10 listings in 90 days, but if you want to come jump out of a plane or hang out in Austin and drink some beer and eat some barbecue, go paddle boarding, there's lots of things we can do in this world. Awesome, man. I sincerely appreciate your time. This was fantastic. I feel like this was a lesson. This is a, a, um, a compressed college class in one hour. So thank yeah, you. I had a ton of fun. I had a ton of fun. And that's a wrap.